Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the After the Show. We have just finished watching Who Do You Think You Are with Cindy Crawford, and wasn't that an amazing episode? Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Jen Baldwin. I am the host of Jen Chat and um, affiliated with the In-Depth Genealogist. We have several guest panelists tonight that I'm really excited about, so we'll give them a chance to introduce themselves, and we'll start on the end with Tammy and move our way back. Hi, I'm Tammy Hepps, and thank you for having me back. This has become a really fun part of my ritual for watching the show. Um, I am here in New York City, and as many of you know, I'm the founder of Treelines.com, which is a website for sharing your family stories. And especially if you have a family tree like Cindy Crawford's, it gives you a great way to visualize the many, 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 many generations of your family while you tell the stories and keep it straight for your family, how you're all connected. Great. Thank you, Tammy. Shannon? Hi, I'm Shannon Bennett. I'm the writer of Trials and Tribulations of a Self-Taught Family Historian, a self-proclaimed newbie genealogist still learning all the ropes. Um, I live in Northern Virginia, and I'm excited that you've had me back again tonight. Thanks. Pat? Okay, I'm Pat Richley Erickson, otherwise known as Dear Myrtle, and you can join me uh, Mondays with Myrtle, another hangout on air over here in Google+. And lastly, Josh. Hey, I'm Josh Taylor. Uh, actually, I'm home in Venice, California this week. Uh, I've been involved with Who Do You Think You Are a little bit. Uh, I'm also the lead genealogist at FindMyPast.com and a president of FGS. And thank you all so much for being with us. It was quite an exciting episode, wasn't it? Tremendously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was very quick. I mean, within the six, first six minutes, they jumped back ten generations. So why don't we just start right there? Um, okay. I have a comment, though. Technical challenge. You have just me on, uh, and I'm sure people don't want to look at me. Apparently, we can't. Uh, you're going to have to control the camera tonight, Jen. Very good. I'll do that. Thanks, okay. Pat. Mm -hmm. So, anybody want to comment on that first six episodes? I will just start by saying that on day one of her research, she got further than I've gotten in more than 20 years. So different families have different challenges, but all the same, I am extremely jealous. <laughs> there are advantages, though, to um, dovetailing into previously well-compiled, well-documented family histories, and I think, Josh, you could speak to that about the Trowbridge family because you used to be at uh, HisGen. Yeah, it's actually really funny. So I'm a Trowbridge descendant, and oh, we work no. on uh, Sarah Jessica Parker's line. She's also a Trowbridge descendant. And so I had sort of you know, done that ground before, and it's one of those things where you know, genealogy, you, you might you lack, you say, 10 generations in you know, five minutes, but really when people are just getting started and they go to NHGS, that happens all the time. I watched it every single day. Wow. And it comes out with citations and documentation, and it's one of the blessings of having New England ancestors. So I have, a, I have some questions about that, actually, if I may. You know, she shows up there, and there's this whole book about her line. To what extent is that, I mean, we'll leave aside authoritative, but exhaustive on the Trowbridges. I mean, the stuff that she was discovering about the Trowbridges, was that information that was also in the book, or was she looking at primary sources that would not have been known to the people who compiled that genealogy book? You know, it's probably, it's a little bit of both. I mean, when, when they're putting together a compiled genealogy, it's at a day and time, usually, when the internet doesn't exist and microfilming was limited. As, so there are sort of faulty conclusions that are made. Though, what's nice is a lot of people go back through and sort of update the genealogies over time and add additions, but I would say, you know, Tammy, it's a little bit of both. <laughs> With okay. New England, sometimes you get, you do get the 10 generations, but if generation five or six has a couple of problems in there. So even if your family connects to one of those books and those old lines, there's still room for you to make new discoveries? Absolutely. They're made all the time. Okay. A great example is when I was there, uh, Rhonda McClure was redoing the Brigham genealogy. And literally, just by adding in the female lines alone, it sort of quadrupled in size. <laughs> and they found, they found like, children from the, the first two or three generations that were missing or sort of had been mixed up with others. And so you do find mistakes in those all the time, so it is care 
you know you have to be careful and go sort of line by line. So what I'm hearing you say, um, Josh, is that um, beginning genealogists are are frequently excited when they find a whole book about their family history um, with that surname and that ancestor mentioned. But um, just as Rhonda McClure went through and worked on the female lines and kind of worked through things, you as a researcher, or I as a researcher, when I find my ancestor in a book, I need to go through each of those generations and see if I arrive at those same conclusions based on what's in the book plus what else may now be available. Absolutely. Okay. So Sh Shannon, have you had any experiences finding your ancestors in a book? <laughs> uh, well, actually I have. It was really exciting. Um, I found that I come from a line of colonists from the New Amsterdam colony. And when I was researching my Hayden family line who um, goes back uh, to New England, uh, they married into, um, I'm going to murder the pronunciation, but Creechstead, I think is the way it's pronounced, and they're a um, New Amsterdam colony. And that was really nice because I found six generations at one time in a published work. Now I'm working on trying to go through those source citations to see if I can verify it because it was a work produced a while ago, but I kind of stood up and did a squee. <laughs> <laughs> Still happy to answer. <laughs> well, and there has to be some basis, in fact, for it. Um, but I think that's the whole point of what we've been studying lately in, in Tom Jones's book, Mastering Genealogical Proof, that um, one of the first things we need to look at is not having to reinvent the wheel. Look at what's been previously compiled mm -hmm. and that may be a good springboard or not a very good springboard <laughs> for our future research. Um, and given that in your case, Shannon, that book was written a while ago, mm -hmm. um, that may have been the best available information and the most logical conclusions to draw from it. But you may have access to additional record groups that are, um, and I'm not talking just available on the internet, I'm talking mm -hmm. unearthed somewhere in the deep recesses of a courthouse heretofore unknown or not known to have existed at the time your person compiled that family history book. But you then can say, this is what the, the compiler thought and it makes sense until you look at this third document over here that's newly discovered and it kind of th puts things in a different light and oh that's so fun so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what else you find out about your New Amsterdam people. Yeah, I think there's also a something that's really important to consider is that they're also written, you know, Pat, you make an excellent point, that they're done at a time when sometimes new records are discovered. They're also done at a very interesting time in history where it's all about white male Americans doing family history. Mm. And there are, there are families and things that completely are left out of those genealogies that are amazing stories where the records were in front of them and they sort of chose to gloss over them oh. to hide, <laughs> you know, all oh, sorts wow. of things in there. And or it is, Things where babies were born a little too soon and like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From the wrong side of town. And yes. Yeah, absolutely. We're ignoring the first wife. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Yeah, I actually have one of those books myself, and they gloss over quite a few of the female stories, just like Josh was saying. So, yeah, it took me a while to figure that out, though. <laughs> what about you, Tammy? Do you have a book? Uh, not even close for my own family. Um, but I was doing some research early this year for a friend who connected to the Phillips family who were in Philadelphia um, in the 1700s and a similar kind of thing where I found a family tree and it was extremely well sourced um, and you know I went to a couple of the places trying to see what records they had that 
may or may not have been consulted in, in putting together the tree because the person that my friend is descended from does no one he appears on the tree but no one appears descended from him so we've clearly found a line of the family that either had not been known or had not been pursued by the person who put together this tree and so in trying to kind of make sure that we have the right connection that there are not two Abraham Phillipses who died in 1808 um, which would tie his connection to this family um, in trying to look back at those primary source records and, and not getting very far initially what I was wondering at the time was was you know had someone kind of attempted to do all this work and what was found was found and I was just you know attempting somebody else's futile research mission so this was this was not for for me myself but it's the one chance that I had to do some research where you know all of a sudden you arrive at this enormous tree and here you are and now what are you done or are you just getting started right <laughs> so in, in my case I don't know I mean we're fairly certain that that it is the same Abraham Phillips for circumstantial reasons but Tom Jones would never accept that yet so <laughs> so still working on it work in progress so yeah. let's um you you bring up something I think that kind of uh, reminded me of the end of the episode where she unscrolls this split twenty long <laughs> <laughs> descendancy chart, um, and I I think we got up to forty generations. Is that right? If you it was her right. forty first great, I wrote made a name. Forty first great grandfather goes to Charlemagne. Yeah. Goes to Charlemagne. <laughs> so what's our reaction to that, Charlemagne? I'm not coming on. in on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll repeat something she 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 said on the the show. I mean, my first thought is, okay, mathematically, we're probably all descended from Charlemagne, but the fact is, she knows how. So to me, that's really cool. She can look at that whole tree and say, not just because of you know mathematics and population growth, this is probably what happened, but. But yeah, she can actually look at the tree and trace up her connection through all that other European royalty. So I don't know. That was that was pretty cool, and I'd love to be invited over for dinner just to study that tree <laughs> in, in great detail and see exactly all the people that she winds through. Yeah, I, she has to have like a three-story dining room wall to put that on. Yeah, <laughs> right, I was kind of exactly. I was laughing at some of the comments on Twitter because it was very much, um, you know, how do you what do you do with something that big? And I was thinking wallpaper of some kind, and then how do you even get it home? I mean, she's in London, and is it a carry-on or do you have to like ship it? Or, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thought it was pretty funny. Josh, how do we feel about um, connections to Charlemagne? I, um, I think a lot of us have kind of poo-pooed that, um, and maybe you can address why that can be a problem for others of us. It, it's a really good question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, all of us, you know, here and and everyone watching probably can find a Charlemagne link somewhere on their tree. Mm -hmm. It's it is interesting because there are sort of documented lines that go through medieval records that sort of point the line to Charlemagne, but. There could be a 200-year gap, a 300-year gap. You know, it's usually the victors who write history. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, you never know what happened. It's We have to remember that in many cases, our descents from Charlemagne come from the third child who married the fourth daughter of the king of whatever, who then had a duke who married the... And so, I mean, the lines get so scattered. I think it's fun. I think it's a great entry into family history. I'm glad it's there because... There are kids out there and even adults who look for Charlemagne. I know who that is William the Conqueror. That's kind of cool, and that might be their connection. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. whether it's sort of can be documented and it's true or not from a you know a paper base, whether every single name on that forty generations is all correct, it's a great starting point and it's a great conversation about family history. Mm. Um, I once knew of a of a study group at the Family History Library where they were digitizing, I don't mean digitizing, um, computerizing all these old lineages from Europe. And I had a friend who um, was from um, Hungary, Transylvania, Yugoslavia area, and in his lineage from that group, uh, the information from that group, there was a woman who was 87 years old who was having her 40-something child, which would be, like, statistically impossible. I guess it's probable, but not likely. Um, and <laughs> I hope so, not. Um, so 
So when the <laughs> medieval records identification unit, the Family History Library, was compiling these in a um, computerized format, they weren't editing for accuracy. They were basically taking what was in that lineage that had survived and putting it into a genealogy database so that it could be used by other people. And so, I, you know, when the person approached me, my friend, Laszlo Apathy um, in Florida, approached me with this, I, I explained to him that process of these lineages that are just because they're in an LDS database doesn't mean that they're accurate. It just means that they've been computerized. And I think we feel that way even if it's a modern database lineage. Like um, an ancestry member tree, we still need to do what we can to prove those generations. But that's just me. I give up around the 1500s. <laughs> Because oh. that's when church records were began to be kept in the places in England where my people are from. I attended a talk that that some folks from Family Search gave at Roots Tech a couple years ago, and it was more of a technology talk, and they were just talking about how they could analyze this enormous database of records that they have. But they had some very interesting things, and they were able to kind of say like what was the longest line that they had in in the database, um, and how many generations back did it go? And it was something absolutely extraordinary. And they and they said that it went back to the mythological kings of Hawaii. If you didn't know, there are mythological kings of Hawaii. <laughs> and so that you could, in fact, go on family search and tie in your tree and descend it to people, you know, many, many, you know, many thousands of years ago before there were any, possi any possibility of records being kept even before, you know, biblical records. Um, and so, you know, more sort of caveat investigator, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, you can tie into the ancient kings of Hawaii, but there's not a single person who believes that they actually exist, including probably the person who entered that data into the family search database in the first place. <laughs> well, but on the, back to the show, the really cool part that I liked about the Charlemagne segment was the dis eyewitness description that had been transcribed. Mm -hmm. where it described his facial features and his health and uh, that he and the fact that he cre that Charlemagne created that beautiful um, um, you know every castle has their um, secret room their uh, their uh, every castle I've been to in Germany and Austria etc um, has a little chapel in it that was no little chapel, was it? <laughs> and that he would visit there every day and live there most of the time during the last few years of his life says something interesting about Charlemagne. <laughs> what, what grabbed you about Charlemagne segment? I have to say, I'm always intrigued and I really like to see when they bring in the historical context to the ancestors. Even if it's just, you know, the, the documents, going to visit the places, walking in your ancestors' footsteps. The church was amazing. Um, I've done that here in the States. I wasn't doing genealogy when my mother was stationed in Europe. Kick myself because <laughs> <laughs> my, yeah. I traveled all over the UK a couple times and all over Germany, and to actually know now that I was in the same towns my ancestors immigrated from and in the same areas they worked and lived, it would have been a more meaningful experience to me. And you could see it in her face. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. this is where I came from. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, being a Midwestern girl, <laughs> I totally understood where she said, I'm just, you know, a farm girl, a meat potatoes kind of person. And that was the type of upbringing I had too. So it really, it really hit home. It kind yeah. of makes me wonder, Shannon, if your ancestors weren't kind of giggling that <laughs> as you were going through their... their <laughs> old stomping grounds, you know, they're kind of looking down at you from heaven saying, if she only knew. Oh, <laughs> oh I, have, I have no doubt that would be their sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Tammy, your myth mythological kings of Hawaii is getting some, some good attention on Twitter tonight, oh, is which it? is oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> 
funny because I mean that was like a real big data technology, very wonky technical talk. But that, I don't know anybody who would have necessarily attended. But I'm really glad that the big pieces of it are kind of filtering out. <laughs> I'm so, kind of um, a Thor enthusiast myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that one. I like Thor too. Um, <laughs> let's switch up a little bit, and I, you know, it was brought up um, with me during the episode. Um, that this, I think, is the first time, and I think Josh can um, ditto this, this is the first time that one of the stars has live tweeted during the show. Anybody else recall an episode where we had mm -hmm. one of the stars on with us and answering questions and responding to all of us? And how cool was that? Very cool. <laughs> very, very cool. When she said that she took her two sisters and her grandma with her on these trips, this yeah, and she is just, posted that picture. Oh, that was that is cool. That really is. Um, that that's something that seems to get cut out. The where the family connects, but uh, she made it happen for us and helped us put that into context of how excited she was to share it with her family. We can only imagine, but they had big smiles on their faces in that picture. Well, and who can't say that you're not excited that Cindy Crawford re retweeted you? I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so from the standpoint of working on the show a little bit, you know, a few times, Josh, what do you, the celebrity standpoint of either being involved or not being involved with the community during the broadcast. Like I know, for example, um, Christina Applegate was very much, um, she tweeted a couple times the day before, she was very much reserved about her ability to participate during the broadcast. So do you have any, um, any perspective on that? You know, I think it, it hits each person differently. And, you know, they have very, very busy schedules. And I was very grateful that, you know, Cindy actually was able to go online and, and talk with us and interact with us. I, what, what I can tell you is it is amazing what happens when sort of the cell phone comes out, you know, in between shooting on the segments and they're tweeting a, a spouse, a child. I mean, I remember um, a couple of, I mean, literally, they're so excited to share what they found sort of that next step because it's, I mean, it's everything. It's their story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they just want to share it with someone. And it was, you know, I remember... Uh, Sister Parker was was or texting her husband and then basically trying to figure well how can I how can I get you know my children involved in this how can I do that that was her first question he needs to know join <laughs> next gen and, yeah, and, and so really I mean working on you know just those I mean it's interesting I think that it touches everyone different it's like family history you know there are some stories that we've all uncovered that we don't necessarily like to share with everybody they're personal to us there's others that are fascinating that we want everybody to know about and it hits everybody differently. Yeah, um, I, I stand corrected. Um, Beth Sparrow on Twitter is telling me that she thinks Rosie O'Donnell did it in a previous season, that she live tweeted. Okay, okay. but That's, I don't remember. So. I think she may be right, but I do remember Lisa, the producer, Lisa mm -hmm. Kudrow, has tweeted. Yes, um, yeah. so That's true. I think she might be right about Rosie. Um, and I can't remember the time zone scenario either. Um, because I think right now people are watching this in California. Um, yes. So, yeah, that would make it uh, challenging. And she was probably on the East Coast at the time. So very, very um, exciting. And, and again, hats off to Lisa Kudrow and uh, all that she's gone through as a producer to find another network. NBC dropped the ball. Uh, majorly, um, and uh, and I'm so glad the Learning Channel picked it up. That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah. Even if people do like to make fun of their commercials quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I hear you. laughs> so this is the first time I remember seeing, uh, certainly this season, seeing a castle on the show that um, <laughs> caused a lot of stir over on Twitter tonight. Um, has anybody else been able to track back to? Castles. I know, um, Mert. You said, dear Mert. You said that you had some German castles. Well, that you my visited. people. I visited them along the Rhine, but those were not my ancestors. My mm -hmm. ancestors had come from Gross Ostrich, and I'm probably mutilating that. And they they were part of that first group: Johann Conrad Weiser, 
um, coming as the Palatine group that came down the Rhine from the Neckar River Valley and they had to pass all these castles and at every castle the chain was drawn across the river and your barge had to ante up and pay the toll so my people would have been looking up at these grand castles it wasn't Germany as we knew it they were principalities and each prince in a castle was due his homage but what got me in in going to the Marburg and a couple of other castles there along the Rhine most of the damage there was from the 1500s not from World War II so if my people are leaving in 1708 and they're looking up at these grand castles that have a bit of damage uh, and they have been part of that war-torn area where the Prussians came across, the French came across, everybody wanted the Rhine River because it was transportation and getting things to market and all that. My people were just bakers and, and poor people. Um, how insignificant they probably felt when they looked way up in, in the hills and saw these grand castles. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Shannon, Tammy, what about you guys? Do you have any experience going back that far? Well, <laughs> not necessarily. I've seen a lot of castles, but I, I haven't traced them back to any particular one yet. I'm sure one day, fingers crossed, <laughs> yeah. I will find something like that. Um, but no, but I have traveled on the Rhine and seen those same castles, and it is an awe-inspiring situation when you're in the little boat and you're looking up the mountainside or up towards the vineyards and you see... How did they pick those grapes when the hill's like that sharp? <laughs> so, funny story. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to tell us. <laughs> well, actually, when I, was, when I was in college and my mother was stationed in Germany, we took a USO tour to several different vineyards, and someone asked them that question because I think we were in the Mosul Valley at that time, and yes. how do you not fall down these hills? They're like this, down yes. to the river. And the woman said, practice. <laughs> and she admitted when she was first married she fell on her butt quite a lot <laughs> uh, I would think they just need to start at the top sit on their rear ends and just hold their hands up and pick the grapes as they slide down I really <laughs> honestly it's so steep it's incredible so you know this is part of that value added service Jen that we give as panelists it's not just about genealogy it's about picking grapes That's for the right. wine yes. you never know what you're gonna get a very well balanced educational show yeah. <laughs> and Hawaiian kings and Hawaii, yeah, yeah exactly and Thor <laughs> um, so let's go back to the show for just a second um, she originally started with this one ancestor and forgive me I didn't write down his name um, who left the United States and went back to England and ended up serving in the English Civil War um, and I noticed there was quite a bit of um, comments on Twitter about oh is that unusual oh no it happens all the time so what's the real answer is it unusual or does it happen all the time or did it happen all the time I heard the answer in the show where um, we tend to think of things in our 21st century mindset where there's lots of people from which to choose a wife if your wife passes. <laughs> but uh, it was explained in the show that only that people came over, the Puritans came over in family groups, um, and then they had some servants. And if if a wife passes away, there's nobody to choose from. You wouldn't be choosing a, a maid servant to be your wife. Um, so that that was considered common practice and that's a great example of why we need to not look at our ancestors life from our 21st century mindset from the rules that we're thinking of the laws in place at this time as we're thinking of it's that historical context thing isn't it yeah, sure is. <laughs> what struck me about that was um, when they were talking about literally the logistics of, you know, because of the war, were letters getting back, were there even ships going back and forth, that you have the impression that these kids were completely abandoned by their father, and they never returned to that in the episode, but I was kind of wondering, I mean, obviously he did not 
go back. Did, perhaps he sent letters that, that, that never made it there because of the circumstances. Perhaps he mm-hmm. attempted to do something that was not quite as dreadful as it seemed, but because, you know, there was not reliable posts. You could not just text message on your phone, hey, kids, go find a foster father. You know, perhaps... <laughs> Apprentice you know, well, <laughs> yourself out, yes. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. You know, perhaps yeah. what it seemed to happen isn't, isn't what happened at all. So when, when Cindy said, look, I'm not going to judge him because it's impossible to know. It just a lot of the circumstances were what made me think that perhaps the real story of what he did and what level of abandonment there actually was was a lot more complicated than the records survived to say. There's actually a great book, um, and I'm trying to remember the exact title of it. It's like Migration in the Atlantic World. But I read it several years ago in grad school and it talks about sort of this modern thinking of how small the world was between sort of England and the New England area and even you know the Virginia area and we think well there's an ocean in between but it's they're they're colonists I mean they're part of that same heritage and they're sharing resources they're sharing information and I mean it might have taken three or four months to get over to them but you know as, as Pat said it's that historical context and you find one of the frustrating things about New England research is that sometimes you'll find someone who pops up for like five or ten years and then disappears from the records and so you, you make the conclusion that, oh, they were there for five or six years, didn't like it, and went back. And that happens more often than we think. So mm-hmm. it's so important to, to dive in and realize that we don't have the full story in some cases. I Googled it, uh, Migration and the Origins of the English Atlantic World. world. That's, that's the book. That's the one. <laughs> it's on Amazon. I'll post it on all the um, social By media Alice, sites, of Allison course. Allison Games, Grimes, something like that. Allison Games. Yep. There we go. Yep, Very like good. Very impressive. Wow. <laughs> he does <laughs> have all the <laughs> <laughs> um, So, yeah, uh, that's going to go on my wish list because I don't research New England at all. Shannon, what about you? Any perspective? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did find it interesting. I don't personally have anyone that's gone over, but I have several friends who I research with who have talked to, who have extensive New England roots and discussed how even in their own families, people would come, some of the family would stay, all the family would stay, none of the family would stay, and they would travel back to England. Um, I, I don't know if it's his misfortune that he happened to decide to go back and the Civil War started in the Cromwell, and um, but it must have been an exciting and interesting time for him. And I have to say, as a person who likes to study history, seeing that coming, I'm thinking, oh, that time frame, oh no, what's going to happen? And um, I was really interested and really intrigued that you know he joined the military, he was a captain, all of his exploits at the, at, um, the castle there. It. I just liked it. <laughs> I don't really have anything else to say. It was just a fantastic little bit of historical context for her family history. Um, I, I'm hope, still hoping one day I will find something like that. I just knew for sure someone was going to die. And then oh, he didn't, know. you know, I knew for sure that they, he was going to die in battle. I, I, I was waiting for that actually to happen because I could remember, um, I didn't go out and look at the Wikipedia article that got posted during Gen Chat, but I did remember from reading it in the past sometime that there had been, maybe it wasn't during that time frame, but there had been um, quite a number of people who had been executed for rising against the king in that town. And I was waiting with bated breath, is he going to be one of those, or is this what happens? And then to have a happy end, well, a happy ending yeah. was, was <laughs> miraculous. <laughs> yeah. So the historical context has come up several times, and that's something that I put in my notes as well. But I'm going to s- merger that into the quote towards the end, giants rather than men. Everybody mm-hmm. catch that? Um, mm-hmm. To put it into context for you, Josh, he's um, she's reading a transcribed document, and they're talking about the villagers coming out of the forest and being a able to come back. of them. Yeah, thank you. About being able to come back into the community, and one of them refers to the soldiers and, and the people that are in the army as giants rather than men. Um, so what are our thoughts on that? Because I think that was probably one of the biggest moments emotionally of the episode. Hmm. Boy, not everybody at once. <laughs> you know, I got the impression. Um, you know, we just saw that that one 
letter that that he wrote in which he was you know petitioning for a, a pension um, you know leave aside all the things that he obviously did in, in battle to preserve the town I, you know I sort of feel like that was his giant moment uh, but I also got the sense that there were a lot more of those kinds of letters that we saw just one but she was talking about it plural later in the episode so I got mm -hmm. the sense that you know even after the war was over his deeds were not done and he looked out for all of those men and not just the one that we saw the letter for so in some ways you know the quote was really great but I sort of got the sense for her it was actually those letters that made much more of an impression um, on her individual ancestor as opposed to just you know picturing the scene of all the villagers come out of the woods and see wow here are our defenders and defenders who were probably pretty much skin and bones after this long yeah. siege mm -hmm. yeah. um, that they had nothing left to eat and no straw and no yeah they did say it was a seven month siege, didn't they? That's a long time to go without. Yeah. Yeah. Without fresh resupplies and all that. I think that we see the greatest uh, leaders, and they usually are military leaders, who care about their men. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to hear that George Washington, for instance, cried at the what his men were suffering over uh, that cold winter in Valley Forge. There was no battle at Valley Forge. It was the, each man's individual battle to survive. Uh, and also later in the episode when there was mention of Cindy's ancestor Charlemagne, how he expanded his empire but there were no walls. There was no need to have walls and and garrisons at diff distant forces because he was a well thought of ruler. He was fair and honest um, in their estimation. Uh, there's That's quite an admirable trait and I, I don't know if I in that position would have been as, as um, thoughtful a leader. <laughs> Are you saying you would be a tyrant? <laughs> Listen, if they didn't give me chocolates at least every week, I would have been upset. <laughs> there wasn't even chocolate in Charlemagne's day. How would you have coped? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have handled it. <laughs> but it's a good it's a good thing to hear that you have ancestors that cared about their the soldiers in their care. And I think Mr. Mert, who's retired military, said the best men that he uh, was led by were those that cared about their men. Even when they were off duty, they cared about them. And uh, that's pretty cool. Any other great leaders in our research um, that we can stories we can share about? Not necessarily to the episode, just in general. You know, I, I was working on a, a case a couple of weeks ago, and it was a Civil War family, and it, it was a Confederate family. And I, you know, as I was diving into the Confederate records, and you think of that there were two sides to that situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you read, you know, you always think, oh, the Confederate soldiers, oh, there's a Confederate soldier. And to some people, that's, that's, what, that's what they want. They want to celebrate that heritage. But it was a story of the soldier when he came back home uh, completely defeated, and Though he'd, he'd been a private, um, he jumped in and helped to start rebuild his, rebuilding his community. And because it had been just devastated during the war, like he'd been away for two or three years. And I, I just had this image of you know, the true soldier who's there for what he believes in, but he's there to protect his family and protect his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I just, what courage it would take to come home after defeat and knowing your entire lifestyle is about to change. You know, having to sign allegiance <laughs> to, to, to this country that you've been fighting against for so many years, but still being so set on repairing and looking out for your community. I just, I thought it was really, really honorable. Boy, that's a good high note. That, that really is. It's good to hear your perspective on that, Josh, um, because you're looking at the human side of it. You're not letting the stripes the way they appear on a flag mm -hmm. or the color of a man's uniform um, prejudice you 
in your research and I think that that's an important attribute that that we need to develop is to have an unbiased uh, viewpoint um, when looking at the records and seeing what activities our ancestors chose to enter into. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. So the last uh, segue I'm going to make tonight, um, some of the comments that I'm watching come across now from the West Coast are related to um, people are supposed to believe through a 60-minute episode of this show that a thousand um, years of documentation can be done in 60 minutes, um, (laughs) which I actually... um, I don't know if anybody else is on the Ancestry.com blogger email distribution list. Um, They've been sending out blogging prompts for the episodes, and they indicated that um, this episode actually required a 1,000 hours of research, um, and they were able to condense that into 60 minutes. So um, put that into some perspective from your own personal point of view. What does a 1,000 hours of research mean to you? (laughs) On one line, Mm -hmm. that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, And that involved on-site research in multiple countries. Um, I don't think they're counting their travel time per se. I'd say that's pretty good. And I think genealogists are willing to do it once they realize that they're not going to take that book on a shelf, hook, line, and sinker, they're going to do the um, legwork necessary to prove or disprove those lineage uh, assumptions, those kinship determinations, and see if they arrive at those same conclusions. And I think genealogists are willing to do it. But as to the hour, do you think Miami Vice? <laughs> do you think CSI? Did you think any of those shows can solve, you know, a murder mystery? Within an hour. Uh Uh-uh. Doesn't happen. It's just television. Yeah. I think Cindy herself said it took him a year of work to do the research. Uh, I think I saw that in one of her tweets that I retweeted. I retweeted it. Yeah, and um, (laughs) Beth is um, confirming that, a year to do all the research. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a reason to be a celebrity, to get someone to do all that work for you for free. <laughs> yeah. I just want a gigantic scroll. That's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll send you one. Yeah, I can. Fill in the blank. I'll, I'll have my four-year-old doodle on it, and we'll send no, you a no, scroll. No, no, no. <laughs> right, we can put names on it. We can put yeah. dates on it. You know, we can do whatever you need to do. We, we can even mail scroll. it around the country to each other. And I know what's on it. Just Review. use giant font and put four generations in like five. <laughs> Thousand point fine. <laughs> That's not quite what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best I could do for you. Maybe you need to agree. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Sounds good. You know, one other thing I heard yeah, in a Twitter uh, post, some, one little tweet was um, Did you notice the difference in spelling of Trowbridge? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it had a W, sometimes it didn't. And, you know, uh, we got to think creatively when it comes to spelling, that's for sure. And that's yeah. something beginners don't get. It's always been spelled S-E-N, not S-O-N. Right. I, I think it was actually Ancestry that tweeted that, um, oh, okay. which was interesting. I think I caught that one as well. And, and you know, that's funny because um, my maiden name is Brown, and my dad had a cousin who always swore up and down that if we just added an E on the end of our name, we would automatically rise in the ranks of the social status of our community. And we never did it. Uh, <laughs> never, <laughs> never, never rose. But, um, <laughs> but every time I do a search for my brick wall, Oscar, which if you've watched uh, often enough, you will know who Oscar is. Um, it, every time I search, I remember her saying that because I have to search for Brown with an E, just like Brown without an E in every other spelling. So, mm-hmm. so I'm curious because I'm going to go back to this. Josh, what does a thousand hours of research mean to you? I'm sure glad they didn't make us watch that on TV. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you yourself. <laughs> Man, we you know, would not be able to have this conversation. We would all be wasted. <laughs> I know, I mean, the, the five of us would love it. I can't imagine it would get a million viewers if that. I'm just, I'm really glad that there are video editors. You know, they're amazing people who can tell a story. And as Pat said, it's TV. Right. Yes. 
they just gave us the good parts, not the waiting in between. And uh, yeah, yep. I hear you. Not the part where they figured out that it's T R O W and T R O U and went, oh, that's a whole different set of. <laughs> 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 yeah, glad they skipped over that. <laughs> A thousand hours of research, Cindy Crawford would start having wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> Poor dear. Uh, well, they sure can't show that, that on TV. <laughs> no, they wouldn't. <laughs> All I can think of is a thousand hours of research is over 300 nap times in my world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could totally relate to that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and we have people on Twitter offering Shannon to make you a scroll. So oh, apparently they can hook you up, so that's cool. <laughs> First you start out with freezer paper. You can buy it at the grocery store. You roll it out and go for it. <laughs> I was thinking rolls of newspaper print, just blank newspaper. Oh yeah, you could get you that, especially now that so many newspapers are going online. Yes, absolutely. Yep. So any closing thoughts? We're just about done. We've got about 15 minutes left, but we'd like to uh, give everybody the chance to summarize their evening experience. Anybody? Come on, Tammy. I know you have more to say. Oh, I have more to say on your previous <laughs> point of before we, uh, Please before do. we wrap it up. Yep. I, I, I uh, was doing a little bit of math here. Um, you know, let's let's say the average amount of time I spend on a week for genealogy, like sort of evening out the binge weeks and then like, you know, the dry spells. You know, let's put it at five hours a week, although I think that's high. So it would take me close to four years to actually get a thousand hours of research in at that rate. And that's just me. And I and I don't tend to hire researchers all that often for the kinds of stuff that I'm doing. It's not always relevant. Um, so once I did that math, that's pretty astonishing. And you know, again, another reason to be a celebrity and get on the show. <laughs> they should have a they should have a raffle. I don't know to put a you know a common person on the show and you know do all the work. That's what um, Genealogy Roadshow is for. <laughs> oh, you know, so that I should start watching that one. I guess. Yeah, it starts. Uh, I have it September twenty third. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so so I don't you know I don't know if that's my my closing thought necessarily, but I begin to wonder, and I'm not going to do that math right now. Whether even with all the work that I've done, have I actually even put in a thousand hours over mm -hmm. the many years that I've been doing this? I'm not so sure. That, but uh, that's not my closing thought. But on okay, your previous we'll, point, we'll come back to you. You can come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Um, I'd like to say I'm just glad that um, we have in our category called genealogy, family history for um, those that are uh, don't know how to spell genealogy, um, that we've got television talking about what it is we do. Um, I get really frustrated when I see certain bloggers, people on Facebook, something like that, really tear apart an hour-long show um, for the very reasons that Josh is talking about, we we know how long it takes to arrive at those kind of conclusions, and shrinking it down into one hour is pretty darn good. But to make it interesting so that it appeals to the average person, um, I I think it's marvelous, and it opens up the possibility for people stepping into our world, even just with their tip toes, just putting the big toe in the water and, and getting them going. Um, I, you know, I think that we ended up going to Ancestry.com per usual and Fold3, which is an Ancestry um, property as well. Um, we went to HisGen. We went to a number of uh, places. Uh, to find out about Cindy Crawford's ancestors. And it I think they are doing a mighty darn good job of showing this research process, albeit accordion squeezed back into a one hour show and I loved it. Excellent. Shannon? Um I have to I have to agree with what Mert said. It the process is longer and hopefully people realize that. Um, it excites me that my family is watching this and can relate to what I'm doing and I'm not following in just my cousins or my aunt's footsteps. 
um, that there's actual purpose to what I'm doing. Um, I really enjoy the fact that I can sit down with my kids and watch this and they can see that not only what mom does and when I go, when we go to the battlefield or we go to the museum or to the library and I talk to them about the historical context for things, that they can see how it plays together with other people's lives as well. And that everybody has a story. Hmm. So everybody has a good guy, a bad guy, a great person, low points, high points. And to wrap it all into one little neat package like this is quite a feat, and I'm really thankful for it. Cool. Mm -hmm. Josh, what about you? You know, I just sort of go off that everyone has a story theme. You know, the reason why they do 10 generations in the first five minutes is because if we share family history through pedigree charts and names and dates, that's just that's not appetizing to people. That's not family history. That's a research report. That's a college report. And the thing that, that really strikes me about who do you think you are and that I love about it is that it's good entertainment. I mean, I'm entertained. I, I like the story. I like I like the story about Charlemagne. I mean, I, I read about him in the history books. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't mind that. And that's, you know, and I talk to people all over the world now and say, you know, that's what I do. I tell people stories. And it's why, you know, to sort of lead into Tammy, it's why Tree Lions is one of those products that mm -hmm. it just goes, it's that next generation of family history because it's it's the stories. And that's why we do what we do. I, I think the most of us, you know, names and dates are just the surface. It's underneath. It's that full iceberg, and that's what keeps us coming back week after week and hour after hour, a thousand hours even. We, we do it for the people and the stories. Excellent segue. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Yet again, I get a promotion, and I didn't pay for it this week either, but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you, um, you, I'm going to send you a bill here pretty soon. <laughs> Oh dear. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I'm thinking, how many hours of, of work do I need to do to pay off my indentured servitude to all you folks for all your <laughs> kind words? Of, yeah, I mean, look, obviously, you know, that's the point of view that I that I came around to, and one of the things about the show is it, you know, for myself and my own family as well, it, it gives a, a place where we can all talk about family history in a way that we can all relate to, and that, you know, the sort of boring, like, look at all these people related to, we don't know anything about them. Um, what that she said in the episode that I actually tweeted when she said it, which I think is, you know, just as true as what Josh was saying about stories, which since I couldn't have said it better myself, I'll just, I'll leave his advertisement as it stands. But she said, you know, she said I was, I was a good student in, in high school and I do remember the history that I learned, but she said, you, lift, you listen differently when it's related to you. And that's what really struck me. Episode. I mean, this is ancient history that, that we're looking at here. I mean, it's pretty far back compared to what we typically see on these shows. And it gets further and further away from things that we can actually even pretend to relate to. And yet here she's saying, you know, I learned about all these things in school. They meant nothing to me. And now that I can actually pick this picture, this guy, Thomas Trowbridge, you know, my ancestor Charlemagne, you know, I can picture these people, these situations. Like here I am in this chapel in Aachen and and. You know, I, this this means something to me. I mean, that's that's I think you know the other reason why we why we do this, or so, because you know there's no other reason why you know if you're a typical person you're going to look at history and and find the meaning in it unless you can personalize it for yourself in one way. And I think that's what genealogy does. And I think that's why you know as much as people might disparage it as you know the work of librarians and researchers and it's a it's a hobby or it's a you know a niche profession I, I would still say I mean it's the way that you get kids to actually be interested in where did we all come from what history did we all share and it's the way that you get people to have sort of the right kind of historical consciousness for living in the present you know a lot of what we're experiencing now in some ways is not so different you know it comes up in every episode things that seem so similar um, and so you give these kids this historical consciousness because they picture their ancestor in the Civil War, you know, coming over in the early 1600s, you know, whatever it might be. It really makes it meaningful in a way. So I, you know, I love that she said that and hope when she goes back and explains to her kids, 
where they come from and does her daughter's report for her or maybe not for <laughs> her, but gives her the scroll and says, here, show this to your teacher. And the teacher's like, what? <laughs> you know, but I, I hope, you know, at least for her kids, that's how when they go through high school, they, they learn it in a totally different way from, from how their mother learned it because they can say, Charlemagne, oh, yeah, our great, 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 great grandfather. Right. Yeah, so I that's love that part of it. Um, I do too, and actually, uh, I think it was Gina Philibert Ortega today was saying something about how her son was um, explaining something about a previous episode to one of his friends, mm -hmm. um, and then actually Sherry um, Hudson Passy just tweeted that she ca taught a class of 14 and 15 year olds on Sunday about family history, and a couple of them actually said that they loved the show. So. Um, you know, I think we can all agree that it's an excellent um, way to engage the next generation. And there's my plug for next gen right there. <laughs> <laughs> See, I take wait to you, Josh. Right, it all works. <laughs> all working. <laughs> so, any other closing thoughts before we call it a night? You do realize I'm in the minority. We think of genealogists for so many years as being the gray-haired old ladies in the family that do it. And I'm so excited with the things that I hear you doing in the next gen group. Um, it's still on Facebook. Have you moved to Google Plus too, or what's happening there? We do have a page on Google Plus. Um, we're pretty much on every social media site. We had a couple hiccups with our website, so we've been kind of doing a soft launch. We'll do it a real big hoopla um, when the website goes live. And I, I actually think it's really interesting. I was wondering if anybody was going to bring up the age factor on the panel tonight, um, because it's okay. I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I just <laughs> I think it's just a really good example of it. You know, just like you were saying, Pat, that it's you know we tend to think of genealogists as retired folks at the very least, and yet four out of five of us are, I'm going to go ahead and say under 40. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm only 42. Yeah. Well, you look like you're, you look 29. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think it's um, just one more example of how we can come together and have a great conversation and. And it has nothing to do with age, actually. Nothing at all. It has yeah. to do with the love of our ancestors and the and all about the hunt. Yeah, that's right. Solving the mystery. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. So unless anybody has any last thoughts, going once. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Really appreciate your time, um, everybody. Tammy's been on more than once. Actually, everybody but Josh has been on more than once. That's a hint, Josh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we would love to have you all on again, and we appreciate everybody who's been watching on um, the YouTube side. And I have gotten a comment that the camera thing is not working for some reason. It's been on um, Pat the whole time. Is that oh, so I hope I was showing appropriate expressions. <laughs> yeah, I so. so I don't know if that's really the case. I'll have to go back and watch it. But we do appreciate everybody watching. And we will be on, of course, next week for the next episode. And they announced who it was going to be Trisha Yearwood. Trisha Yearwood. Yeah, Trisha cool. Yearwood, next one. Um, and then we will bring up... Um, Genealogy Roadshow one more time because I'm excited about that. And there was a clip at FGS that was shown, and I didn't get to see it, and I'm kind of mad that I missed it. So if you're an FGS, you're a lucky, lucky person that you got to see that clip. Well, and I think we have to congratulate Josh as president of the Federation of Genealogical Societies for um, the arrangement in 2015 for the Federation to jointly have a conference with Roots Tech here in Salt Lake. Um, I think that's a cool idea and very innovative. So kudos to you for that, Josh. You and your board did some good work there. Yeah, well, ditto. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We're looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I volunteer to help since I'm on I'm the boots on the ground here. I'll help. All right, excellent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See, look at that. You've already got one volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so thank you all very much for watching, and we will um, call it a night. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next week for Who Do You Think You Are after the show.